Oh, good morning, church. It's really nice to be with you all today. A uh, lot of smiling faces, and from my side, happy Mother's Day as well. Uh, we'll be reading today from uh, Mark 10, and that will be from verse 17 to 31. So that's Mark 10, uh, verse 17 to 31. The rich and the kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home, or brothers or sisters, or mother or father or children, or fields for me and the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Thank you. John 1 tells us that Jesus is the word that becomes flesh. So the word said, is it the S or the C that's silent? Said. 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 Hard hitting journalism there. Happy Mother's Day. Great to see you here. Very special welcome to you this morning if you're a mother or a grandmother. At 8 o'clock we had some great grandmothers. I don't know whether that means they have great grandchildren or they just grandmothers and they wanted to be called great. I wasn't sure. I didn't want to ask. We're so thankful for all of you and for those who play a similar role in the lives of so many at this stage. Of course, we're aware that today is a difficult day for uh, some people for various reasons. Uh, we have dear friends who haven't been able to have children uh, despite their uh, long prayers and uh, I lost my own mum a few years back to cancer and so today is a mixed kind of day for us as I celebrate the mother of my children uh, but remember my own mum. So our thoughts are with you today uh, but for whatever reason that you're here this morning, I'm delighted that you're here because I would like to share a great gift with you today. I want to give you the chance to change your life and to change your destiny. And I want to show you how you can escape the comparison game once and for all. Uh, we're in a series of talks looking at challenging questions, questions that are asked of those who have uh, faith or belief in Jesus. So far, we've looked at the question, how can you 
be sure that the Bible is true. Last week we looked at the question, how can there be only one true faith? And today our question is, can you be good without God? Can you be good without God? Uh, I think there's various ways of actually asking this question or, or various meanings that are meant when this question is asked. And so I want to explore a few options this morning. And I want to show you by the end that this question means that we need Jesus more than we ever thought we did. And I want to give you a chance to respond to his offer for yourself. So that's where we're heading this morning. Uh, I want to have a look at the options of the way of understanding this question. The first way, can we be good without God, can mean something like this. Can people who don't believe in God do good things? Can people who don't believe in God do good things? And to this, we've got to say a very clear yes, of course. I remember a conversation I had with a guy some years back. He said to me, the problem with you Christians is that you think you're better than other people. You think you're the only ones who do good. But I don't need a God threatening me to know that I shouldn't kill my next door neighbor. I can do good things better actually than some Christians that I know. It was a pretty intense conversation actually, as you can get the gist of it there. But he put his finger on something which I think is too true too often. And that is many people who come to church behave with a sort of moral smugness that reminds me of a, a story that Jesus once told. You find it in Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Pharisees are religious leaders of the day. They do all the, all the externally right things. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that, that this man, says Jesus, this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus' point was that even the most outwardly religious people actually have nothing to boast about because what matters before God is humility and empty-handed trust. In fact, if you read the Gospels, Jesus saved his most scathing criticisms for those who thought they were good because they were religious. Now, the reality is that Christians and people who don't believe in God are capable of doing good things, helping the poor, showing kindness, being generous. We've had very kind neighbours over the time we've been married who get our mail and bring our bins in when we go on holidays. We've never been to church. And so if the question is, can people who don't believe in God do good things then we have to answer yes, of course. But that does lead us to ask a second question. How do we know that what they do or what we do is good? That is, how can we describe any kind of action as good or bad or good or evil? So here's the second way that this question, can we be good without God, can be asked. Can there be such a thing as good or bad without God. So I really like Thai food. Right? I love the flavours, the stir fries, the curries. If it's, you ask me what our go-to for takeaways, it's always Thai. I think Thai food is great, but I don't think that you have to agree with me about that. You're free to disagree, actually. Uh, 
my preference for Thai food over, say, Latvian barbecue, I don't know, is not something that I think that you have to share with me. Or to put it another way, I don't think that it's bad or evil for you not to like the same flavours that I like. Okay, that's just my opinion. But I really do think that cruelty to other human beings is bad. I think that you should feed and look after kids if you have them. You should clothe them. You should make sure that they flourish. I think you shouldn't hit other human beings or treat them cruelly. And I don't think this is just an opinion that I have and you're free to disagree with me. I actually think you should think the same thing about this as me. I think mistreating other human beings is actually wrong. It's evil. Now, on what basis can I say that? What basis can I say, you should agree with me on this particular matter? On what basis can I label any type of behaviour as wrong or bad? And some people would answer that question by saying, well, the way that you work out what's good and bad is by a consensus of the people. Right? So if uh, enough people think that a behaviour is wrong, then it's wrong. The problem with that answer is, I don't think any of us actually believe that, if you think about it. I don't think we think that if you get enough people to agree with you about something that it's right, then it actually makes it right. And of course, the example we have in history of this is Nazi Germany. Lots of enough, enough people thought that destroying a particular uh, race of people, the Jews, was the right thing, and that's the way they proceeded. But we look on that and say, that's not right. But how can we say that? Or well, let's think about it from another angle for a moment. Let's think about the social justice angle. So we've invited you to come and have some uh, a, a coffee or tea or some morning tea with us afterwards. If you go and buy a coffee, the coffee that we serve here is fair trade coffee. That is, we make sure that it's sourced from farmers who we know are paid the right amount of money for their labour and their products. Because... We want to change the practice where coffee farmers are exploited and underpaid and therefore struggle to feed their families and do that. But, but on what basis do we, do we get in, involved and interfere with the, the way other people do business? Who are we to say that exploiting farmers is a wrong thing to do? How do we come up with that label? On what basis do we say it's right or wrong? We can only do that if there is an external reference point, a transcendent reference point that, lie, that sits above everyone else's opinions by which we can measure what is right or wrong. The Bible's take on this is that we can tell what's good and evil, right and wrong, because God himself is good. And he has woven his goodness and an understanding of right and wrong into the creation that he's made. The reason that things or actions are good is that God is good and his ways are good. That's what lies behind Jesus' answer that we heard in Mark 10 that was just read to us. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Jesus is saying the only way that I could be called a good teacher is if somehow you're referencing goodness against the one who truly is good, and that is God. So God alone is good. And if you go back to the, the Bible's uh, origin story in Genesis, you see that God bakes his goodness into the created order like the grain of a piece of wood. Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. When God says his creation is very good, he's saying, it fits with my character. It's an expression of my good character. 
And it has been made fit for the purpose for which I've created it, which is to have a creation in relationship with me so that that creation can experience my love and it can love me and love the others that I've made. It's fit for that purpose. So if our question is, can there be such a thing as good and bad without God? I think the answer is no, not really. If you have no external transcendent reference point for good and bad, then actually you have no grounds for seeking justice. You have no grounds for reforming society. All that we're left with is different people's opinions. And then how do we work out whose opinion should be the opinion that governs us all when we're determining right and wrong? Normally the way that works out is that whoever holds the biggest stick or the most amount of guns, their opinion gets to be enforced as right and wrong. Some people say, oh, I don't know why you're going on with this. We all just know what's right and wrong, don't we? We just know. But I would say to that that we are living off the capital, off the Judeo-Christian worldview about what's right and wrong. And the longer you bear down on that capital without replacing it, the more dangerous things will be. If you do away with God, you actually soar off the branch that you're sitting on to argue for things like human rights and to argue for justice for any minority or for anyone. Which then leads to the third way that this question can be asked and probably the most important one to get right. And here I'll get to the gift that I promised right at the outset. Is anyone good enough on their own to meet God's standards? We'll come back to the encounter with Jesus that we heard read from Mark chapter 10. The man in this encounter, he's aware of God. He's aware of God's standard of goodness that he has to meet in order to be in a relationship with God and dwell with him forever. That's what leads to his question. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. When this man asks, what's the good things that I need to do in order to inherit eternal life? Jesus refers him to this transcendent standard of goodness that's been given by God in the form of the commandments. Even so, the man feels confident at this point. Knowing God's goodness, knowing his good commands... He goes, verse 20, teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. No problems. Tick, tick, tick. And I suspect a bunch of us sitting here this morning might feel confident at what Jesus has said at this point as well. What what did he talk about? Don't murder. Don't lie. Don't defraud. Don't commit adultery. Maybe a bunch of us could go, yep, tick, 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 tick. Is that it? But Jesus' next question exposes this man and actually exposes us as well. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything that you have and give to the poor and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The man's face fell not because having money is bad. No, money is a gift from God that can be used for good things. No, the man's face fell because he loved money more than God. Jesus' request was a way of getting at his heart If he could give all the money away, he could show that he didn't actually love it, but he couldn't. He couldn't even fathom doing that. 
The supreme good for human beings, God's word tells us, because we're made in the image of God, the supreme good for us is to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength and then to love others as we love ourselves. That makes sense. If God alone is good, if he is the standard of perfect goodness, then it is right that the demand upon human beings, the good thing for them to do, is to love he who is the greatest good. That just makes sense. And what God requires of these human beings is love. Not keeping rules, but love. The rules, the commandments were only ever given as a guideline on how to love. The man couldn't give the money away because he loved it more than he loved God. And that's why, as you read on, verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Notice it's not just hard for the rich, he says... It's just hard, full stop. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to go through the king into the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And we need to hear what Jesus is saying here. With man, it's impossible. It's impossible for us on our own efforts to be good enough to enter the presence of a perfectly good God. It's impossible. The Apostle Paul put it like this in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 9. Jews and Gentiles alike, that's a way of saying the whole human race, Jews or Gentiles, that covers everyone. Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have altogether become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. He's not saying you never do any, a good thing. You take your bins out, your neighbor's bins out. He's saying no one does good by God's standards, loves him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength on their own. None of us are good enough. And at this stage, you might be going, so where's the gift? What's this good news? Like, it's not sounding good at this stage. That's not the end of the story. Because the last question you ask is, well, then is there any way to be viewed by God as good enough? And we need to remember what Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. It is possible for the good God to do something for us to be seen as good enough to be in a relationship with him. It is possible. And in fact, it's been done. A little later in that chapter, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says these profound words. He says, even the Son of Man... That's a reference to himself. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came, in other words, to live the perfectly good life that we could never live. And then... He died as a substitute for us. He died to take the penalty that we should have take, had lying upon us for, for failing to live the life that God demands of us. He died to take that penalty on himself so that we wouldn't have to. And for all those who give up the quest to earn our way to God... And instead, trust in Jesus' sacrifice with empty hands and humility like the tax collector from Jesus' story. For all those who do that, God will grant eternal life. Starting right now. Starting today. And stretching forever. forever. That's the gift of grace that God is offering you today. And that completely changes the game. It changes your life It changes the future, 
It changes your destiny. I love this uh, illustration from a British preacher that I once heard. I think he sums all of this up really well. Imagine, if you can, there are shelves that run as far as the eye can see that way and that way. And on these shelves are photographs of every human being that's ever lived. On the top shelf are the photos of those that we might regard as saints, you know, the best of the best, your, your Mother Teresa's, your Nelson Mandela's, your Gandhi's. Put them on the top shelf. On the next one down, we might put our, the national heroes, you know, your Simpsons, your Victoria Cross winners. Then on the next shelf down, we might put people of good character, you know, people who volunteer, they help others, they're, they're usually kind, people that you'd love to call friends. Then on the next one down, we might put what we would call ordinary people. You know, sometimes you do good, but other days you have a bad day and it might not be as great as your good days. And then on the next one down, we might put you know, people who are lazy, who drain others, who, who don't contribute but just expect others to provide for them. And so on, until we get to our bottom shelf and then we put the really evil people. We put your, your serial killers and your Hitlers and your Stalins. When the time comes for God to judge who goes into heaven, where would he draw the line? You know what most people's answer is? They work out which shelf they'd place themselves on and then they draw it just underneath there. <laughs> but God draws the line down the middle. And on the one side are the people who've heard God's offer of mercy and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus. And they say, you know what, I don't need that. Or, I'm not interested in that. Or, you know what, I can't believe in that. And on the other side are those who have heard the offer and they've realised no matter what shelf they put themselves on, they need God's mercy in Jesus. They realise that Jesus was good enough in their place that he died to take their penalty. And they trust in him so that now they can live free of fear of the future. Now they can live free of the need to compare their performance in life with other people. Now they can live free to love others without needing it to be recorded as credit. Which will it be for you this Mother's Day? Because that offer is there right now. And I want to give you a chance to take it. I want to give you a chance to cross over from this side to this side. And I'm going to do that by leading us through a prayer of acceptance of God's offer. And here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to put the prayer on the screen. I'm going to show you what it says. And then in a moment, I'm going to ask everyone in the room, whether you want to pray the prayer or not, just to bow your heads and close your eyes. And for those who want to take hold of God's offer of forgiveness today, you can pray this prayer after me. I'll pray it line by line. You can repeat it in your mind. And then after we've done that, I'm going to give us a chance to respond and I'll lead us through that. So here's what the prayer says. It's up on the screen. It says, Dear God, thank you that you alone are good and that you are the reason that we can determine what's good and evil in this world. I'm sorry for all the times I fall short of your goodness. Thank you for sending Jesus to be perfectly good in my place. Please help me now to live with Jesus as my Lord and transform my life to be like his. That's the prayer. I'm going to ask everyone in the room, whether you want to pray it or not, if you don't want to pray it, that's completely fine. Just take a moment of rest from closing your eyes. But those around you might like to do that. So let's everybody do that. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to say this prayer slowly, line by line, and give you a chance to echo it in the quietness of your mind. And if you do that, know that the Lord of heaven and earth is listening to you. Here we go. 
dear God, thank you that you alone are good and that you are the reason that we can determine what is good and evil in this world. I'm sorry for all the times I fall short of your goodness. Thank you for sending Jesus to be perfectly good in my place. Please help me now to live with Jesus as my Lord and transform my life to be like his. Amen. All right, well, thank you for that. Now, what's going to happen is there's going to be a QR code come up on the screen if you want to grab your phone and, and zoom. I'd like everybody to do this. Again, everybody has uh, something you can do. It's going to be an electronic version of a card that looks like this with a bunch of options, and we'd love for you to fill in one of the options there. Know that one of the options is no thanks, not today. So even if uh, that is you, uh, if that is you, by the way, um, thanks for not uh, getting up and walking out in the middle of what I had to say today. It's great to have you here with us. Let me just uh, gently urge you to think about that question of uh, can you actually have the categories of right and wrong, good and evil, without God? And if so, how? That's something for you to chew on as you leave. But thanks for being here. It's great to have you with us today. If that's you, fill in that box so that we can know uh, that you are here. There's other people, though, there's with uh, a different... Um, they might want to fill in a different option. Uh, if you already have prayed a prayer like that some years ago, praise God. Praise God. I hope today was an encouragement to you as a reminder of the grace of God. You can fill in. I already have a relationship with Jesus. If you heard uh, what I said today, and it's intriguing, but you can't commit to uh, something as big as that prayer today because you've got more questions, then great. Well done. That, that position, I think, has a lot of integrity. And the next step for you is to chase down the answers to those questions that you might have. In a couple of weeks' time, we're starting a short course that goes through the basis, basics of Christianity. And in that, there's the opportunity to ask whatever question you want. Uh, you won't be asked to pray out loud or read the Bible out loud or do anything that's uncomfortable, but you will have a chance to ask questions and to have them answered. So if you're interested in something like that, or just a, another way of having your questions answered, let us know, say, I still have questions, and we would love to follow you up. But there's a, another set of people here today. You either prayed a prayer like that a while ago and have wandered away, but you're back here today, or for the first time you're praying a prayer like that. If that is you and you did that today, praise God. Right now, Jesus says, for everyone who was lost and comes home, there's a party in heaven. It is, uh, you've crossed over from death to life and it is a magnificent thing and we would love to help you take the next steps in your relationship with Jesus. And so let us know that you've done that by saying I'd like to start or I want to restart my relationship with Jesus. If you give us some contact details, then we can follow you up and we'll do that this week. All right, as you uh, finish up that, uh, we appreciate your time and, and effort to do that. I'm going to pray for us as we finish up. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us in the Lord Jesus. We thank you that your goodness is the anchor for all goodness in this world. That as we see things that run with the grain that you've put into this creation, we know what is good and we know what is evil. We thank you that though on our own we could never be good enough for perfect goodness, that you sent Jesus to live the life we should have lived and to die the death we should have died in our place. We praise you for the gift of grace that is life now and for all eternity. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.